Let's take a look at 2006 form B, problem six. It says the function f is defined by f of x equals one divided by the quantity one plus x cubed. The Maclaurin series for this function is given by one minus x cubed plus x to the sixth minus x to the ninth and so on, um, which converges to f for negative one less than x, which is less than one. Um, so the first thing I'd recommend you do before you kind of start reading um, parts A, B, C, and D is just take a minute to absorb what was just said. Um, so they're basically saying that this function, which could be referred to as f of x um, equaling one plus x cubed, they're saying when they say that it converges, that this series converges to the function for these x values, they are saying that this fraction is exactly the same as this infinite polynomial. And they're saying that this equal sign only holds true if your x values are between negative one and one. So now that you've taken just a beat to um, comprehend what the given information is, now let's move on to part A. It says find the first three non-zero terms and the general term for the Maclaurin series for f prime. So let's go ahead and go about that. So f prime then would be, and I'm gonna skip past this and jump to the term by term expansion that was given. I'm just gonna take the derivative of it. I took the derivative of the left side, I'm gonna take the derivative of the right side. I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. So d dx of one is zero, um, d dx of negative um, x cubed, d dx of x to the sixth, d dx again. And then they said to get the general term, and to do that, I would just take ddx of this general term that they had given us. Remember, you're taking the derivative with respect to x, so as far as that derivative is concerned, these n values are constants. So negative one to the n would be a constant multiple, and then you could just use power rule here on the right side, so. There we go, and then it would continue past the nth term. And that's all they asked for, for part A. Okay, part B. Use results from part A to find the sum of the infinite series, negative three over two squared plus six over two to the fifth, et cetera. Now, if you look at, they said use results from part A. So let's look at part A, and let's compare part A term by term to this expression. And really, what's the relationship between this expression that they gave us here and part A? What they plugged something in for x to get this expression. They plugged in x equals one half. So you could kind of point that out. So we could say, hey, negative uh, three, and then I'm just gonna rewrite this first term as negative three times one half squared um, plus six times, and then this could be thought of as one half to the fifth, next one, minus nine times one half to the eighth, and so on. You know, what is that equal to? That is equal to um, our f prime expression where they plugged in one half. So that's the first thing is realize that that's what they're up to. And now it says that they uh, want us to um, evaluate that. Yeah, to actually evaluate that. And there are a couple different ways to go about this. I mean, you could notice that this is an infinite geometric series with a common ratio of, what are they multiplying by? Negative, uh, what are they multiplying by? <laughs> All right, is it geometric? Oh, it's not geometric. I'm gonna be quiet now, it's not geometric. Um, anyway, so it's okay, it's not an infinite geometric, but you could, uh, th so that kind of pigeonholes me actually into doing it a certain way now that I think about it. Um, so f prime of one half, uh, because they're plugging one half in, and that is one of those numbers in your interval of convergence, it means that you could tie it back to this rule right here. So 
if f of x is 1 over 1 plus x cubed, then how could we get f prime of 1 half? Well, we could start out with f of x is that, and then you could get its derivative. Let's see, how do I, how do I want to do this? Let's go this way. So what would that be? Don't forget chain rule. You know, something like that. And then what do they do to get f prime of 1 half? From here, they would just plug in 1 half. You know, um, and then I think at this point you've probably earned the credit. I do, would say if you took a couple steps, it took me one, two, three steps or so. Um, and you could simplify it to be negative 16 over 27, which is pretty satisfying. I do think that you would have earned the credit had you just written this previous expression, however. Okay, um, let's move on to part C. It says, find the first four non-zero terms and the general term for the Maclaurin series representing the integral from zero to x of f of t dt. Okay, um, there are a couple different ways to figure this out. Um, I like kind of being on the cautious side here. So I would say that this is the same as the antiderivative of f with x plugged in. Take away the antiderivative of f with zero plugged in. Um, okay, so then since they said, uh, you know, first four non-zero terms and the general term, it looks like, looks like I forgot to do the general term when I did it before. Um, anyway, um, then we will go ahead and look at, okay, well, what would, you know, big F of X be? So let's go about that. Um, so here's F of X, and we're just going to do antiderivative. And technically, the antiderivative would have a constant of integration, so I'll go ahead and put that down. Um, and then you'd have, um, let's see, X minus X to the fourth over 4 plus x to the seventh over seven, minus x to the tenth over 10. Let's see, one, two, three, four non-zero terms. And then they said the general term. And so let's do the antiderivative with respect to x on the general term that they gave us. Remember that anything with an n in it is considered a constant as far as this antiderivative goes. So we could write it as negative one to the n times x to the three n plus one divided by 3n plus 1. That would do it. There we go. Okay, um, so now let's do, you know, what would, let's figure out what happens when you plug 0 into this expression. Well, any, what happens to any term that had an x in it if you're plugging 0 in into something like this? It would go to 0, and so you'd only have that constant of integration yet left. Um, now let's subtract them. So, on the left side, what do you get when you subtract these two expressions? Well, you'd have that integral that we started out with. And then on the right side, you notice that the constant of integration, of course, subtracts out, which we would have expected. I hope everybody knows that you do not have to show your work exactly the same way I do. If you're getting the same answers in your own way, there's plenty of room for that. But at the same time, I hope that what I'm saying here also makes sense to you. Okay, so this would be the answer for part C. All right, let's see if I have room to fit part D here. That'll be a small miracle. Okay, it says, use the first three non-zero terms of the infinite series found in part C, so that's this guy right here, to approximate the integral from zero to one half of f of t dt. What are the properties of the terms of the series representing uh, that integral that guarantee that this approximation is within one ten thousandth of the exact value of the integral? Okay, so let's look at that. So they want us to evaluate the integral from zero to one half of f of t dt. And if you look, what would you have to do to the expression that we had before to get this expression? Well, looks like all you'd have to do is replace x with 1 half. So, um, so and since that 1 half is in this interval of convergence, um, then we could say it is indeed equal uh, to uh, 1 half 
minus one half to the fourth over four plus one half to the seventh over seven plus one half to the tenth over ten and uh, and so on. Am I missing a negative somewhere? I am right here. There we go. Here's the thing. We want this to be an alternating series because we're going to need the alternating series remainder theorem in just a second. Now notice I've got an exactly equal to symbol here and then I also went beyond the required number of terms uh, by one which was on purpose and then I'm, going, I'm saying that you'd have an infinite series here. Um, now in the next step I'm going to say well this would be approximately equal to um, and then that would be approximately equal to just the first three terms. Um, how come the first three? Because that's what they said to use. Um, now it's up to you how much arithmetic you want to do here. Um, I kind of, uh, I honestly like kind of got sick of doing arithmetic so I decided that I was just going to kind of play the I don't really have to simplify things card on the AP exam. <laughs> So I personally would probably just leave it like that as opposed to doing the arithmetic to get common denominator and get this all down to one fraction. It's not that I can't do it, it's just that I don't want to right now. Um, anyway, uh, so there you go. So there's the first thing they asked for. There's your approximation. Okay, um, now they said, what are the properties of the terms of the series representing the integral from zero to one half of f of t dt? that guarantee this approximation is within 1 1,000th. Okay, so let's look at that. If you were to simplify these terms, what would we notice about them? Number one, they are alternating in sign. This is an alternating series. So let's look, is this a convergent alternating series? It is if the absolute value of all the terms is approaching zero and decreasing in value. And I could tell you right now that that is definitely happy, happening just by looking at the numbers or, you know, focusing on them. So here we are, we're looking at a convergent alternating series, um, in which case we could apply the, the alternating series remainder theorem. So the difference between the actual sum and any nth partial sum um, is always within the absolute value of the first neglected term. So, um, so let's look at that. So because This is a convergent alternating series. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to math speak here. So the difference between the actual integral from zero to one half of f of t dt and my third partial sum is guaranteed to be less than the absolute value of the first neglected term. So the first neglected term was negative one half to the 10 <coughs> over 10. And then let's look at that. So let's see. Let's do 2 to the 10th really quick. I know 2 to the 5th is 32. So let's go 2 to the 6th. Uh, uh, 2 times 32. 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. So the negative 1 half to the 10th, or sorry, the 1 half to the 10th is 1 over 1024. Divide that uh, or multiply that by 1 tenth if you want. And you know that this is equal to, oh, running out of room. And that is less than one ten thousandth, which I'm really running out of room. So ten thousandth would be ten to the fourth. There we go. So sorry for the lack of planning on the spacing here. Um, anyway, but that would do it for explaining that last part as to how we know that this, even just using the first three terms, gives you that much accuracy. All right, my friends, I hope this is helpful to you. I hope you're doing well. I hope the whole online learning thing is working out for you. Um, I've heard that some of you have been getting some much needed sleep and I can't help but to think that that is a really good thing. Um, anyway, so hopefully you can focus on the bright side of things. We'll get you ready for that AP exam, so don't worry about that. Take care, everybody.